we are still waiting for a few attendees to, jo to join in, so just bear with us a few minutes and we will begin. Good afternoon, everyone. We are about to begin our pre-proposal conference for BETA's RFP number 2017-08 for Managed Security Services. We certainly want to take an opportunity to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We do realize this is a busy time of the year for everyone involved, so it really means a lot that you've taken the opportunity to sit in for this session. Um, what we hope to convey to you this afternoon is the primary purpose is uh, to present a general overview um, of the project and provide some governance and, and guidance on your actual preparation and submission for the proposal. So uh, presenting this afternoon, we will have Tim Rickman. He's our project consultant from Integra Supply, who will go through the uh, various areas of the RFP as we present. So Tim, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Bridget, and again, uh, welcome. Um, my name is Tim Rickman from Integra Supplied. As um, many of you know, we've been involved for some time with Vita, helping them with this uh, with this change program, and we are helping Bridget and her colleagues in SCM as, as we walk through the procurement. You also hear the voice in a, in a little bit of Chris Payne, one of my colleagues, who will talk through some of the, the finance documents. Um, again, thanks for joining today. We really appreciate the, the large response, despite such a short notice. Obviously, the question on many of your minds is, why, you know, why did we schedule this on such a short notice? The RFP hit the street two days ago, late in the afternoon, um, and, you know, of course, you wouldn't have had much time to, to address the documents yet. Well, of course, we were trying to balance um, the work around the holidays. We didn't want to step on the holidays any, any, any more than, than necessary and really wanted to get as much in, info in front of you as possible. The purpose of this call is really to accelerate your absorption of the document. And so even if you haven't had a chance to dive into them yet, that's okay. It's, it's very much a logistical and process-oriented call to orient you, to give you a readout from us verbally on, on what's there and how to, how to approach it. It's not really intended to be a detailed Q&A about the, about the solution. We will have some, uh, some time, hopefully, at the end of the hour for, uh, for some Q&A, and, uh, and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. But, um, but You'll have plenty of time over the course of the coming weeks to ask questions through Bridget that we will respond to in writing as you better understand the documents and have questions about the process, the documents, or the solution, or whatever. Also, I want to let you know that this conference is being recorded, and, and unless there's any technical issue or whatever, we will post this soon on YouTube. It's possible we'll have to do it uh, right after the, the Vita holiday over Christmas, which, which would be Tuesday. But in any case, what this will allow is you to share this video with, uh, with your, your peers or partner suppliers or that sort of thing to, uh, to catch up even if you weren't able to attend today. So, you know, after you wear out those holiday movies and you're finishing up your eggnog in front of the fire and looking for something else to watch, you can, you can navigate to this YouTube channel and, and find something even more riveting. So, um, so with that, let me start in to the agenda. Um, what we're going to talk about today, is, as Bridget and I have mentioned, is most in orientation to documents, why are we here, what's some of the background, um, and, and then we'll talk through some of the response format and timing and, and, and walk through some of the documents. I also want to remind everyone that, that this conference is really for informational purposes. We, we think it's helpful, we hope it's helpful, 
but in all cases, any written documents would supersede what we say here in this conference. From time to time, a question may come up. Um, maybe we answered incorrectly or misspeak slightly off the cuff. Um, and if we do that, if you see any inconsistency, certainly you may ask a question to bridge it in writing. Uh, but but you should uh, you should assume that anything in writing on EVA supersedes anything stated here. As I mentioned, in full disclosure, we, we, we're recording this and it will be posted. We will also post um, a copy of this presentation in PDF to EVA and we'll, we'll post the registration list, so all those persons who, who registered before the conference. Um, it, and just in terms of Q&A, obviously the lines are muted. At the end of the call, we will ask you to ask questions via the question tool within the web conference or to raise your hand and we'll try and address it. If there's any issue or you know, technology or you're not able to get in due to time, you're welcome to ask questions in writing afterward by email. So I've got a couple of background slides and I'm sure that many of you have been monitoring this process for some time or have been engaged with VITA and so a lot of this now is a repeat. We've had informational sessions, we've had web conferences for other procurements and so I'm not going to spend as much time in the intro as I have sometimes in earlier conferences. But suffice it to say that um, this program is very much about replacing the existing comprehensive in infrastructure agreement under Northrop. The security services is a component of that. And that it's that the new model is very much focused on agents, a balance of agency needs as well as enterprise needs. And so you will see if, if you are uh, brought forward into, into rounds of, of, of working and clarifying and meeting with uh, with Commonwealth stakeholders here as part of this process, you'll see many agency representatives involved. They've been helping develop the requirements and build out what goes into this RFP that will be in, uh, involved in evaluating the solution and finalizing it with, with those select candidates. Um, the, and, then, and then finally, this is a, a multi-wave program that, that we're undertaking to, to cover all the procurements between now and the expiration of the CIA in 2019. And so my next slide, we, we have a little bit of a rundown of that. So all of the services under the CIA were being replaced under these three waves. So the first wave is, is already com completed now in terms of procurement. So messaging services and mainframe have already been awarded earlier this, this year. We are now in wave two. And wave two was intended to cover off the multi-sourcing service integration function, which is that cross-functional layer that sits across the top of all of the services within um, within the environment. And that procurement has been on the street uh, and we have received responses from suppliers for that. So that, that was the first part of wave two. The server and other related services is still upcoming. And then security, of course, is this particular RFP. Now of note, and, and then later we, we intend to procure anything that's remaining as a, as a final wave ahead of July 20, June 2019. Um, but I think of note for today is that security is the first of any of these procurements to hit the street that is part of, um, that will be implemented coincident with or after the MSI is in place. And so it's really the first RFP where, where, the, where the RFP is written to align with and integrate with a multi-sourcing service integrator, which is yet to be picked. So, so I, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that subject as we go through documents today. So we've got two slides describing goals, and we're not going to spend much time reading these. These are right out of the RFP instructions. Um, but I wanted to call out that there are two types of goals that we have listed in the instructions. And the first set is the IT Infrastructure Services Program. This is the overall sourcing program and the future state operating model. So the Commonwealth, VITA in particular, is, is seeking to create a multi-sourcing ecosystem that achieves these three things. So they want to maintain and improve service quality. They want to ensure cost competitiveness both now and in the future. And they want to create a platform of, of service delivery that's highly visible and accountable. And so the, the multi-sourcing service integrators are part of that. The various service tower suppliers that are coming in, such as the security provider, will, um, will be a part of that. Um, and, and, the, and the agreement is structured and, and concepts like operating level agreements and shared service levels are intended to help support that. Um, the second slide gets into the goals of this particular RFP. So every one of the RFPs we would release in wave two or wave three will follow this framework. We'll have our program goals and then we'll have our RFP goals. 
And this is what the, the security solution team has put in place as the things that they are trying to address with this particular RFP. So of course, the, the first and foremost thing is we've got to replace what we have today. And then, and then in a more detailed fashion, um, you know, we list out how, how, how this RFP will help support the operational functions of the CSRM directorate within VIA. And uh, again, I won't read those, they're there in the RFP for you. <clears throat> also of note in this particular RFP, um, and, and this is, is unique uh, probably for the other Wave 2 and Wave 3 RFPs. Um, basically, this, this particular set of services, VITA is, is first and foremost seeking to uh, identify a supplier to provide its services in, in the security function to VITA and its customers. Those are the intended to be the enterprise executive branch agencies under mandate, but includes a couple of others. That, that VITA may choose to operate as customers that, that interface with VITA directly. But separately, uh, the security team wants to make sure that this agreement is available for other public bodies. And that's something that VITA often does with their agreements, but for purposes of the Wave 2 and Wave 3 agreements, um, for the, like MSI, for example, hasn't been structured that way. Um, but, but the security one is, because there is an, an anticipation that some of the services, or maybe all the services provided by by an incoming security supplier should be made available to other public bodies. And that term means something within Virginia. It's various other public sector entities, some of which may be outside of Virginia, that, that can access the services on this contract under their own statement of work. This means two things that I wanted to point out. One is that as an incoming supplier, it represents a large potential business. So it's above and beyond. What, what VITA itself offer, which itself is, is relatively large, but there's other business potential beyond VITA. But second, the agreement is structured to address kind of both worlds. Um, it, it's, it's, and I want to point out that it's mostly written to address the VITA environment. There are terms like managed environment, and we describe the governance model and things like that, which is all written to describe how it would interact with VITA. Um, that that if, if another public body, which we call an authorized user, were to execute a statement of work, some, some of those functions would be, would be adjusted for their particular scope. And so, so you'll see that throughout the agreement, and I've just called out where in the RFP objectives and partly in the Master Services Agreement where you can start to understand that better. <clears throat> the next slide is about the response format and timing. Um, this is straight out of the RFP instructions, so nothing new here, but it's a, but it's obviously an area of great interest as you're thinking to, to build your timeline to get this proposal in. Um, so what we require to come back is a single copy of the whole proposal, a hard copy, one hard copy, um, and then three CD rounds or USB drives. And you may hear me use some of these terms interchangeably. We tried to use the term disk to, to be generic, but, um, but, but there are three copies that we're asking in, um, in electronic format. This one is the entire proposal. You can think of it as the solution part of the proposal. So it excludes anything related to price. So it's everything except the pricing documents, which are Exhibit 4 and the sub-exhibits to Exhibit 4, which you'll see later. Um, this 2 is all of the pricing-related stuff. So it's all of the Exhibit 4 elements and doesn't need any of the things that were on Disk 1. Um, it is, as you probably recognize, this is, this is because our internal teams, we're trying to keep them walled off, at least in the early phases, in terms of um, you know, having a solution team address the solution elements and a finance team address the finance elements. So we ask you to separate those on the, on the submissions. And there are, there are more details about that within the RFP instructions and within a document we call the table of documents. And then finally, disk three is a copy of your entire proposal, both solution and price, with anything proprietary redacted. And um, every state looks at uh, what is proprietary differently. Um, basically, if you do not mark anything proprietary in Virginia, then it will be subject to open records requests at the end of the procurement. And so if you do want to mark something proprietary, you can do that. And then you should include on disk three a redacted version of your proposal where anything that you think is proprietary has been removed. Now, there are rules within Virginia about what is proprietary, and you'll need to understand that. But it's definitely the case that your whole proposal is never proprietary, and pricing is never proprietary. And, um, but we'd encourage you to 
to, to look at the statute to understand that a little bit better. Um, as I mentioned, more guidance is found in Section 3 of the RP Instructions and Administrative Appendix A, the Table of Documents. That lists every single document with the RFP and whether it needs to be submitted back and if so, uh, which disk it goes on. <clears throat> and then finally, very important, is the due date and time. We've got it February 2nd, 2016, 2017, February 2nd, 2017, an error which we'll fix on our uh, posting, um, at, by 4 p.m. Eastern Time. It's really important that it's on time. This is, um, you know, this is the one thing we call sort of mandatory requirement. Um, if it is any second past four o'clock, um, we will not be able to take it. We do want your proposal. So unfortunately, SCM has experiences where they've had to turn somebody away after after 4 p.m. And then, finally, um, perhaps the meat of this call, we will talk through some of the documents. So. We're going to start with the RP instructions, and then I'll go with the table of documents, some of the other documents to see. And um, with that, I will move off the presentation here um, into the instructions. Now, what we've done um, in the instructions document, at least for purposes of this presentation, we're in everything, but we've marked yellow a few places to pause and, and talk for a bit. Uh, with that, I'll hand it off to our single point of contact from uh, supply chain management, Bridget, to, to go through this element. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> As Tim have, has mentioned numerous times throughout his presentation, again, my name is Bridget King, and I will be serving as your single point of contact for this RFP throughout the process. And we uh, establish a single point of contact basically just to uh, assure that we uh, maintain consistency and that we have a channel for providing correct information back to you all as we go through the process. So any questions that you may have relative to anything within the RFP, um, please direct those concern concerns directly to my attention and a response will be provided. Okay, so um, also as Tim mentioned, we will not be going through every section of the instructions. Certainly they're pretty clear, but we would like to highlight and emphasize certain aspects from certain sections. So first and foremost, I would like to speak to um, Section 2E, which is about the announcement of award. So by now, for you to have registered for this conference, you're probably familiar with our EVA website. EVA serves as our general communication portal for the RFP process. Um, once we get through the entire process, any awards that are made will be posted on the EVA website. Additionally, any changes, amendments, question and answers that um, we've uh, entertained throughout the process, posting of the registration, all of this will be contained on the EVA website. So, and it does, um, it is updated real time, so we encourage you to check that frequently throughout the process for any communications that we put out from VITA. Also, um, you don't have to be registered with EVA to participate in the RFP process. However, should you be recommended to receive an award, it is a requirement that you have to be registered with EVA. So please keep those points in mind regarding the uh, announcement of awards. The next section that I would like to hit on, and Tim has talked about this briefly as well, is Section 2J, which talks about proprietary information. Please be mindful that VITA reserves the right to release proposals publicly. Suppliers may indicate some materials as proprietary, but only in accordance with Virginia statute. The entire proposal cannot be marked proprietary. We have seen instances where we have, you know, we receive proposals and everything is proprietary. That is unacceptable. We will reach back out to you should that be the case. Additionally, pricing is never considered proprietary. Should we end up um, making an actual award, pricing information will become public. Please keep that in mind. Okay, um, we will move right along to uh, Section 2K, which we talk about proposal protocol. Tim has mentioned the format that we want you to submit your proposals in. The only thing I would like to reiterate there is that um, we cannot 
accept a late proposal. That's about the only mandatory re requirement that we have for this RFP. That is that it re it's received on time, February 2nd, no later than 4 p.m. Anything received after that will not be accepted. Okay. So we will move on down to Section 2N, which speaks about the evaluation process. The evaluation approach and processes are outlined in this section. Um, we here at VITA think that it's very important for you to understand how we will be reviewing your proposal. Therefore, all of the steps involved um, within the evaluation process are outlined. And we, we follow these um, steps that are listed here to the T. So everything is listed there for you. Section 3A. We speak to the supplier's proposal format, covers proposal format and response disk, and we've talked a little bit about that before and what's contained on each disk. Um, refer to the RFP table of documents to indicate which file goes on which disk. So all of that is outlined in that section. And it's pretty straightforward, so it just basically tells you or it keeps you reminded as to what you need to submit and where. Section 3B speaks to the preparation of your response documents. As indicated in the table of documents, <clears throat> for those documents you respond to, there will be two types. You will be presenting um, your information either in a template or a table form. A template document is a document that you complete in some way, and it includes instructions for completions within the template. So everything will be there and tell you exactly what you need to provide. The tables um, that you will be providing information back to us in are for the documents such as the MSA, Exhibit 3, and a few other documents where a table will be outlined in your RFP. And the supply, you may be able to comment in the tables at the front of the document, and instructions for populating the table with contract-ready language are there. So you just need to follow the instructions, and um, that should be able to guide you as to exactly what you need to provide and how you need to provide it. Across all of the response documents, whether they be template or table, you should assume that it is putting forward contract-ready proposal language. Don't assume that we will come back to you to ask you to edit that or negotiate that. Please give it to us exactly as how you would be willing to agree to. So that basically um, touches on some of the areas that we wanted to emph emphasize throughout the instructions. And I will turn it back over at this point to Tim. OK, thanks, Bridget. Um, with that, I'll move to the RFP table of documents. And so this is, um, this is really just a uh, a, a guide for the whole RFP. Um, just one moment. Okay. So I, I'm going to use this. I, I'm partly going to explain this document itself, but also use it as um, as a method to provide an overview of some of the other documents, and then I'll open some of those documents. So, so if you've if you've looked at this already, you see that it's a a, a grid of all the documents provided with the RFP. And then, as we mentioned, off in the rightmost column, or, or the two rightmost columns, it says response format might be NA if we don't need it back. For example, we don't need a copy of the RFP instructions submitted back. Um, but if we do, we say, okay, this is a template, and, and the vast majority of them do say template, which, as Bridget indicated, means that there are instructions within it to tell you how to fill it out. And then, um, and then it would go on response CD1. And so everything is marked as, as either template or table uh, in response CD1 or 2. None are marked as 3 because, as I said, a copy of everything would go on disk 3. Um, I'm going to open a couple of these documents. but uh, but but let me just provide highlights here. So um, uh, administrative ap appendix A, uh, these administrative appendices, by the way, are all documents that relate to the procurement and uh, the procurement process and may not necessarily become part of the contract. Um, but the, the first is the supplier profile. This allows you to provide 
information about your experience as a firm, reference clients, reference to financial information, things like that. Of course, within the document, there's a series of questions for you to respond to. Appendix C is the standard agreement response form. This has uh, various acknowledgments and affirmations that, that you understand certain aspects of the RFP and agree to certain things within your proposal. Authorization to transact business within VITA, it's the State Corporation Commission form. Um, Appendix E allows you to indicate which documents uh, or which co co components of your RFP you believe are proprietary and therefore would be redacted. The Supplier Procurement and Subcontracting Plan allows you to indicate uh, subcontracting providers and indicate SWAM, that is Small Women and Minority Owned Business information on that Appendix F. And then finally, uh, the VPAT form, Appendix G, that's a voluntary product accessibility template um, that that uh, allows you to describe how your services or your solutions may be accessible for uh, for the disabled. And um, this, despite its name, um, it's, it's marked as voluntary. That's just the name of the document by the agency that produces it. Um, and I think within it, it's marked as Appendix C because it's their form, but don't, don't be confused by that. We call it Appendix G, VPAT form, and, and, and you should submit that as part of your proposal. Then we've got a set of environment overview appendices. All of these are provided only for your reference. They're not intended to be part of the contract. They're not part of um, your, uh, your, your proposal or something. They're a bit like reference information, as, as you might get in a due diligence phase, but we thought it would be helpful to release. Um, one of them has been provided on EVA with the RFP, and that is the VITA program overview. It describes this sourcing program. It goes into more detail about uh, the history, the, the work that we and Tegra Supply did over the last year to help assess and recommend some change, and then, um, and then what is the plan for the future. That's been released with the RFP and posted. Then there's a whole slew of other documents that describe the environment. Um, many of them are marked reserved because we've got them as placeholders to perhaps complete for later RFPs. But, but th this is our team describing information about the environment. These, for the most part, we did not post on EVA because many of them, and because they described a lot of the environment, um, so we thought it would be best for you, if you want them, to request them via Bridget. So any of these that have an asterisk, are marked available but must be requested, you email Bridget and she will send them back to you. And that's pretty much all the environment overview appendices and there's one other RFP document which I'll mention in a minute. After that in our list of documents we go into the contract documents and so these are all smart contract documents and that's only to say that all of the documents in the rest of the table are intended to become part of the final contract. Some of these, so first of all is the Master Services Agreement. It has, at the beginning of it, a table. So this is one of the table format documents. So rather than redline or edit or change throughout the MSA, uh, we ask you to populate any feedback or changes within the table and their instructions right at the beginning. Um, and then there are a number of attachments that relate to the MSA. These may be added to or removed over the course of, of the process depending on your solution. Um, but, but there are some MSA attachments that we believe may be needed now, and so they've been released with the RFP. They don't need to be submitted back, so that means really they're free reference for now. So um, I, I'm going to move off of that and move back to the slide deck for a second, because that's all of the RFP-related documents and then the contract itself and the attachments. But then we get into the meat of, the, of, of really, really the content for the RFP. And we have divided that into these five exhibits. And the way I would like to tee it up is, is we see that every uh, large IT services contract should have these five components. And we say there's, there's traditionally with contracting been at least three components. Every contract you sign should have a description of services, a description of the price, and the quality. And for us, that's exhibits two, three, and four. Um, and then in an IT services contract, we need to describe governance, change, and that sort of thing. That's exhibit one. And then finally, human resources, personnel provision needs to be a part of it, and so that's five. And so we've tried to logically group all of the exhibits within that framework. And so I'm going to open some of those documents, and my colleague Chris, we're going to open some of those to share them with you. Um, obviously, you'll, you'll want to spend time in all of them yourself. But let me start then with Exhibit 1. 
Exhibit 1, I'm not going to open any of the Exhibit 1 related documents, but um, ex Exhibit 1 is called Integrated Services Platform. And that's because this document and all of these documents, sub-exhibits to one, describe the whole uh, um, IT infrastructure services program and governance model that BETA is trying to establish for this multi-sourcing ecosystem. So it's got you know, Exhibit 1 itself, which describes the program at a high level. We've got the definitions of the whole agreement. So this is uh, you know, a, a long file that is the defined terms used throughout the contract. And we want to keep it relatively consistent between agreements, so this RFP and other RFPs, so that we have a consistent language. Um, the governance framework, this is VITA's governance model is it, that it's trying to establish with the support of the MSI. And it describes the, um, the, the concepts of relational governance, you know, the major forums that VITA would use to engage with its customers. And then operational governance, the sort of day-to-day -day and week-to-week operational meetings like change meetings and um, you know and that sort of transition management meetings or whatever that may occur. All of that's described in the governance framework. Um, 1.3 is an outline of the service management manual, which would you know one day be an enterprise document or binder of documents describing processes and procedures for, for VITA and its suppliers. And then exhibit 1.4 is the operating level agreement outline. Again in this multi-source managed environment we will have operating level agreements and um, and suppliers such as yourself operating in the service tower supplier role will be expected to, to make operating level agreements with the MSI and with other providers as part of your own responsibility to the Commonwealth. So that's Exhibit 1. Um, <clears throat> exhibit 2 has more documents and it's it's really the, the technology and the solution, the sort of operational requirements. And I'm going to open a couple of these to give you a feel for what's there. But before I do that, I'll walk through the list. Exhibit 2 is really just the umbrella document that incorporates all the, all the service component documents. Um, 2.1 is the description of services. This is, this is really the big document that describes all of VITA's expectations for security services. And you're able to say yes or no. You're able to comply with each one of those items or not. Um, 2.2 is a special document in that this is a document that will go to all service tower suppliers. So the security supplier in this RFP, the server supplier in another RFP, and user support, everyone would have this Exhibit 2.2. It mirrors the MSI RFP uh, statement of work, basically. So it will, um, it, it describes the various roles and responsibilities of of the other suppliers to interface with the MSI and support their uh, their activities. They're basically the, the handoffs within the ITIL framework. So then we get 2.3. And 2.3, these are empty templates for you to populate your solution. And it aligns with the index within 2.1 and 2.2. So 2.3.1 is an open document for you to describe your solution to address all of the requirements indicated in 2.1. Now what I'll tell you is there are many requirements and many sections and we've and we've kept we've we've kept the outline the same. And we want you to provide an open narrative and be able to use charts and other things to explain your solution. We think that understanding the solution is very important. Um, but having said that, it's often difficult for our evaluators to understand, you know, how one requirement, you know, requirement R27, let's say, in exhibit 2.1 is being met with a description somewhere in the 2.3.1 document. So we want to make sure you do as thorough of a job and referencing requirements and that sort of thing to help it become easier for our evaluators to understand your full solution. 2.3.2 is your solution document to describe your approach to the cross-functional services, to your integration with the MSI. 2.4 is the implementation plan. That's a Word document template that you can think of as kind of like a project charter type document that describes your approach to implementation. Um, and then the implementation milestones is an Excel template for you to indicate key milestones along your, your project plan. So if you have behind the scenes, for example, in a thousand, a thousand row uh, detailed project plan, we would expect that you might pick the sort of 50 or so top milestones out of that and drop them into this implementation milestones template to, to help us understand it. The transition out plan is, is different. It's sort of the inverse of that. Uh, this is a template which um, 
which we don't need you to, to submit back in this, but you, but you may. Um, but it's, it's a te template for you to provide a, a description of how you would transition out of Vita services uh, or out, out of services with Vita at, at the time of termination or exp expiration of your agreement. So that's something we definitely will have completed by the time we uh, implement your services, but, but, it's, but it is the, uh, um, the transition out, the termination or expiration event. Current and planned projects, this is a list of projects underway within the Commonwealth that you may be involved in supporting later. Um, it's, it, you know, of course, once it's written, it's out of date, so we will continue to update it over the life cycle of the project. Because the team felt it had somewhat sensitive information, it's also available on request. It was not posted in EVA. Finally, within Exhibit 2 is the sites list. This shows you, um, you know, the sites that, that VITA has, uh, that VITA is supporting. There's some sites that have been redacted for security reasons and that sort of thing, but it's a pretty good list of our sites and, and customers. And then it also allows you to indicate uh, sites that you might provide services from. I'm going to quickly open um, at least two of those documents and get a sense for the for how they're laid out. Um, 2.1 is the, as I say, the core description of the managed security services. Um, it's a quite a lengthy document. There are instructions we indicated at the top for how to populate it. Um, there's an overview um, that, that describes the various sections that what the team was thinking when they laid out these sections. And then you get in the meat of it. And we ask you to say, okay, here's a requirement. Read it. If you agree with it, you can do it, and you will you will perform it as part of your solution within your price. Enter a yes here, um, and you can describe it if you like. Um, but this cell is especially to be used if, for some reason, you say no. And if you say no, you can't meet it, or can't meet it as written. Then you you would say why here, or you might change the language or what what you would do in order to meet that requirement. So that's how this document is to be used. And you can see it's quite long. As I hinted at earlier, there are these requirement numbers which allow us to refer to things easily. We can say, oh, in R67, you said this. So it's all numbers like that. And we've got a quite lengthy list of requirements, 1,461. Um, no one of these is itself a mandatory requirement. We want you to meet um, all of them, or as many of them, to the extent possible. But you are OK to say no in some of them and explain why, um, you know, if need be. Um, 2.2 looks exactly like it. I'm not going to spend, you know, any real time on this in terms of format because it looks exactly the same as 2.1. But as, as I mentioned, it its sections are mirrors of what the MSI requirements are. So all other requirements within here describe, you know, service catalog management, for example. What would you, as a service tower supplier, do in coordination with the MSI in the area of service catalog management? So that's the purpose of this document. Um, and then finally, I'll open the um, a solution template just to show it to you. There's a template, but it's largely a blank document. Um, but the table of contents is the same as what is in Exhibit 2.1. So you can write your, your solution in alignment with all of our requirement sections from 2.1, the empty template. Okay, so with that, I'm going to move to Exhibit 3. I'm going to try and do that a little bit more quickly, although it's you know, not really much or any less important. Um, exhibit 3 covers our reporting. It's called Reporting and Service Level Management, but it's really the quality aspect. How are we measuring and monitoring quality uh, for the course of the contract? And so Exhibit 3 describes our overall approach to service level methodology, to reporting and customer service. Um, this, uh, our definitions of severity levels, this document is intended to be the same for all suppliers who operate within our multi-sourcing ecosystem. So certainly as we work with the MSI and perhaps with some of you, we might adjust some of the methodology, but, um, but it's intended to be the same for everyone and once, once written because it talks about how uh, suppliers will work together with shared and related metrics, some of the reporting timing and that sort of thing, so, uh, or definitions of severity level. And so as you can see, when we're working together, to deliver a service as multiple suppliers, we need to be talking the same language and working on the same handoffs. And so Exhibit 3 explains that. And it's got a table at the front for you to comment on it if, if you like. Um, then we've got two other documents for you to at least respond to that describe our, our service levels. 
Um, so three, exhibit 3.1 is the service level matrix. And so we list here the various metrics that the team is seeking, um, some of which are shared or related with the, with the multi-sourcing service integrator. Um, and we've got critical uh, service levels and key measurements. We've got critical deliverables. And we've got a tab for you to make any recommended changes there at the end. I realize this is an eye chart and I'm moving quickly, but, um, but you'll be able to see it within the RFP. Final document I'll show you before handing it off to finance here is the definitions of service level. So exhibit 3.2. This, this document uh, has the same list of items as listed in the service level matrix, but it provides a description of, of these metrics, so kind of the verbose description. And then there are blue cells at the end for you to populate sort of the how you would do some of those things. So we described the, the, the metric and sort of the math problem, the algorithm, what we're trying to measure. And then, and then we asked for you to describe how you would collect the data, report it, and, and the like. And we may have a couple of yellow highlighted questions and comments throughout the document for you to address as well. With that, I'm going to hand it off. We're going to move into the Exhibit 4 section, which is finance, very important. I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Chris Payne to, to lead us through some of those documents. Chris? Hello. Um, so leading into the finance exhibits, it, exhibit four is the sort of description of the basic financial structures, the terms and conditions that will govern, govern the finance portions of the exhibit. And I'm actually going to take just a couple minutes and talk about the structure we'll be using in this agreement because I think it'll make the documents a little clearer. We've got a concept of a thing called base charges, and these are the charges that would be charged for all of the services in all of the documents that Tim just described at all of the service levels in Exhibit 3 if the volumes of service we consume are what they are at the start of the contract. So the base charges are sort of intended to cover all of that. And they're assigned to resource units. And each resource unit is a chargeable unit, um, some component of service. Uh, each one has a volume. And then if the volume of those resource units fluctuates up or down, we would pay an arc rook charge. And the arc rook charge is intended to be the marginal compensation up or down. All of this is described in Exhibit 4 in a, in a great many words. But uh, that's sort of the high level. Um, and so so a lot of these documents are going to concern themselves with the detail of that structure and the dollars that go with it. Um, we recognize that providers might have different thoughts on how they'd like to structure the pricing. And so we, we've asked everyone to please respond to the structure as is. But feel free to propose other thoughts. We know that uh, different solutions are, are sensitive to, to, to different sorts of changes in the environment. And we're inviting everyone to reflect that back to us. So Exhibit 4 itself, words on the, the pricing provisions, the structure, and how this is all supposed to hang together. 4.1a is the pricing and volume matrix. And we'll come back to that in a little bit and look at some of the details. But this is where the actual pricing would go, where you would populate base charges, arcs and rooks, and a number of other details. 4.1b are a set of milestone charges. Milestone charges are related to implementation work. Um, getting things up and running. Uh, they're tied to some specific deliverable. Um, and upon delivery of that deliverable, the state would then pay that milestone charge. Exhibit 4.2 is the resource unit definition. So I mentioned that all of the base charges are tied to some resource unit. And those are the things that will have their volume fluctuate up and down. Those are defined here in Exhibit 4.2. 4.3 is the financial responsibility matrix. This is a document that is intended to describe who's buying what portion of the solution. Is the provider responsible for labor, software, hardware, as it relates to a given component? Exhibit 4.4 is the form of invoice. This contains the details of how the state um, needs to be invoiced. Um, the way the state's business model works, the way the VIA's business models work, Providers invoice us, and then we turn around and invoice agency consumers. And so some of this invoicing detail is very critical to make, uh, make it so Vita can recover from the end agency consumers and then turn around and pay the vendors. So important stuff there. 
4.5 is the base case that we will judge the financials again. Um, and as a function of that base case and uh, the provider proposals, we'll build business cases, which are one of the evaluation criteria. Um, 4.6 is a set of security-related assets, which are being used to provide the services today. And um, you can read in Exhibit 4 about how those assets will be bought out from the incumbent and then used to deliver services in the future. We don't have our heart set on continuing to use them forever. We could transform portions of the solution, but of course we'd want to understand how can we get to the ideal state from our current state. 4.7 and 4.8, like 4.6, are what do we have today as regards uh, security software and security contracts. And 4.9 is a billing triggers document that is intended to clarify how do charges turn on and turn off. So I've ordered some service and it's stood up for uh, use and it's documented in such and such a system and it's pulled on this day. And it's intended to uh, minimize disputes in the future if we're all real clear on what are the criteria for something being billable or not billable. Tim, why don't you go ahead and open up 4.1a and take a, a short walk through that. So the first tab that needs populating is the base charges tab. Um, it's broken down by all of the different resource units. Um, you can see on a later tab what the volumes of these resource units are, but if nothing in the volumes changed, none of the services we consume change, um, a person could just reference this tab and see what we would pay for all services for the life of the agreement. If you go to tab two, This is the ARCRUC tab. This is the marginal cost for one additional unit above or below the baseline. So if I need one more desktop encrypted over and above the baseline, it'll cost me X dollars. If you go to resource baselines, these are our forecasts of the volumes of all the resource units on the previous tab. So how much of these various things do we need? So when you price the base charge for uh, security incident management, um, you're pricing six FTEs of security incident management plus whatever overhead you're choosing to allocate to that particular RU. Tim, I don't know if any other, anyone else is seeing this. I'm seeing a sort of furious oscillation between the sheet and the deck. OK. I'll try, I'll try closing the deck and see if that helps, but... Oh, okay. Okay, go ahead. Shall we go to pass-through? Yeah, let's go to pass-through. So the state is not specifically requesting any components of this solution be passed through, but if uh, a bidder would like to propose or, uh, part of their solution, for example, a software product, they say, um, we'd like to bake this in, but um, for whatever reason, we don't think that'll work well, and so we'd choose to pass it through to you. We'd, we're asking that any of those components be documented here. We're anticipating nothing, but we have had vendors ask in the past, and uh, this is where you would document such expenses. This next charge is a, is this next tab is a base charge by cost type, and the purpose of this tab is, is not to be invasive. We've had providers in the past be reluctant to fill it out because they felt like it revealed too much information. It's really to foster understanding. Um, it's so easy to miss each other when you're passing documents back and forth, um, and this is a sort of roll up of the base charges on tab one, split up by category. And the hope is that in looking at it, if we've missed each other on requirements or solution, or we just happen to be talking about two different things, um, we were expecting a heavily software-driven something, and it's heavily labor-driven, or what have you. Maybe this information helps us realize we can create a dialogue um, and uh, move to correct it, rather than having some miss, which then gets discovered down the road, and we have, have a dispute, obviously good for no one. 
Rolling on to tab six, authorized user pricing. So this is the pricing information for uh, entities that would consume these services that are not part of the VITA mandated agencies. And uh, in some cases, we believe that a service would simply be one more of a unit that already has some supporting infrastructure. And in some cases, we believe that if such an agency wanted to consume um, such a service, they would need to build a new something and build a new set of infrastructure, make a set of investments. And so we've called out which of these services we think should just be one additional X and which of these services we think should be one additional X plus whatever the implementation charges are to get up and running. Moving on, supplier investments. Uh, again, is an understanding tab um, uh, in an effort to avoid the chance that we miss each other conceptually and we're picturing very different things. Um, it really does seem like we should be able to write down the words and read them and perfectly understand what's going on, but I've had parties miss each other in a significant way before. This is to draw that out ahead of time so we can catch and discuss and make sure we have a meeting of the minds. Tab 8, termination. Uh, interacts with a termination methodology described in the MSA and Exhibit 4. This tab is intended to be a set of caps on the termination calculations found in Exhibit 4. And the way the methodology is written, termination is the lesser of the amount calculated as a function of the formula or the caps. This isn't intended for us to um, skate out not paying what we regard as a fair amount of termination. If we terminate for convenience, we do intend to essentially uh, compensate for investment. But um, it's hard for us to understand what exactly those investments are or will be, and so we ask for them to be capped at some number that the provider is confident keeps them whole so we can evaluate this solution has lots of investments, and if we terminate, it will be very expensive for us. This solution has less investments, and so if we terminate, we're relatively protected. If you want to respond to the termination methodology, please don't just put dashes here or um, if you don't agree with the termination methodology, please mark it up in the appropriate way in the feedback form um, rather than, I don't know, put zeros in these cells. The literal interpretation of zeros in these cells is all termination is capped at zero, but that might not be what you mean. If it is, great, but uh, bear in mind that this tab interacts with words in Exhibit 4 and the MSA. Tab 9, inflation sensitivity. There's an inflation methodology described in Exhibit 4 that allows the charge to increase over time as a function of inflation. It, it is based on a specific index, and that index, the base charge, and this inflation sensitivity um, calculate the future charges. We would think things like labor would be inflation sensitive. We would think things like capital um, equipment would not be inflation sensitive. We would think the relative mix in your solution would be reflected here to allow you to earn some fair inflation amount to pay your employees, but not earn inflation on, for example, hardware, which has decreasing costs over time. Tab 10 is the rate card. Um, gives a place to describe specific positions, which can be consumed uh, as needed or ad hoc basis. What uh, that position consists of and then what that position would cost to consume for project work and so on for things that are over and above the existing base services. And then finally, tab 11 is a set of assumptions that underlie your proposal. This tab will not exist in the final agreement. These are assumptions that you will want to verify via due diligence, via clarification sessions and so on and work to remove them leading up to a final contract signing. And Tim, that's all I have on the finance stuff. Thanks, Chris. Um, we will then move on to Exhibit 5. Um, just a couple of quick things there, and then we'll open it up to questions. Okay, uh, Exhibit 5 is... About, can you hear me? Tim? Yes, I can, Bridget. I was yep. just reminding you yeah. we've only got about five minutes left in the session. Yep. Um, 
So Exhibit 5, Exhibit 5 itself is a, a blank umbrella document now. Provisions related to personnel are in the Master Services Agreement. Key personnel allows you to populate um, you know, names of individuals and positions, which would be key uh, assigned uh, to VITA. And then the personnel projection matrix is a grid for you to show FTEs by month throughout the term. And this helps us to understand your staff loading. Um, our, our, it helps our finance folks better understand your pricing and, and that sort of thing. So it's important for us as well. I am going to uh, end the prepared remarks there and move us toward our, um, our just final Q&A moments. And we can, we can stay a little bit past the hour, I think, if, if need be. But, um, but let's open up to questions. What we'll want to do is encourage you to use the tool here. Uh, I believe you can ask a question and a comment within the tool. You can also raise your hand, and we can try and call on you there, open up your line, although sometimes we have trouble with that. So let me pause there, and da unless David or Bridget, if there's any other logistical note. No, we're good. Okay, thank you. And I mentioned David's name. He's one of our colleagues here helping us facilitate. But go ahead. Um, if anyone has any questions, please uh, please indicate so within the web conference tool. Okay, it says Exhibit 2.7 on the EVA site appears to be corrupted. Can it please be re-uploaded? We will check that one. Um, yeah, I, I have a, a, yeah, I've already looked at that, Tim, and I'll talk to you after this, um, after we're off to see um, about getting that. Okay. We'll take care of it. Very good. Okay. Okay. All right. Are there? I want to pause just another minute. I realize that it's uh, it's early in the process. A minute I've had a chance to get into the documents. Um, so let's let's see if there are any more questions here. Okay, we have one. Um, I may have misheard, but is it a requirement to purchase existing in-place security infrastructure from the incumbent? Chris, would you like to speak to that at all, or shall we uh, defer that one? An answer offline. Is it a requirement to purchase existing security infrastructure from the incumbent? Um, the answer is yes, but let me just check on something real quick. There's a set of security assets providing service, and they'll be necessary, um, you know, to continue providing service as we move to some new forecasted model, um, we, we might migrate off of those assets very rapidly. Uh, but I, I think, Tim, we have this all described in the instructions. Yeah, it should be further described. Essentially, um, I, I think there's two ways to look at it. Um, certainly, and you're starting to answer from an operational perspective. There may be a need to keep assets for an operational reason. That, I think, is very much up to the incoming supplier. But separately, it's kind of like, what does Vita do with the assets on the outgoing basis from the existing supplier, and how do we cover off that cost? And so there is an anticipation that the incoming supplier will will help with that process. I think beyond that, we will, um, you know, if, if if that doesn't make sense or if you have further questions, please ask it in writing. We'll try and get you a more detailed response. I'll wait one more moment. I know it takes time sometimes to type out a question, even if you're interested here. Yeah, and Tim, the other thing I'll add is, while we've got a set of assets providing a set of services, and we will need to get from here to there, we're not wedded to doing anything any particular way. We want to do it sort of in the best way that creates the most utility for uh, Vita stakeholders. And so if there's a new solution and we're on some old firewall and we can move to some new firewall, we'd very much like to understand the how will we have today be run how we, what is the new state, and then how do we get from existing state to new state? Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, 
So I do have one more question, and again, feel free to continue typing questions. Um, will you require a certain portion to be SWAM or for small businesses? Uh, VITA does not require, this is not a mandatory requirement, and there's only one mandatory requirement, which is a, that it's on time. But, um, but uh, VITA has worked hard to support the governor's executive order to encourage SWAM business. And so as you've seen in the evaluation criteria, uh, we do have one where there is some additional credit given in the evaluation if a supplier is a SWAM business, um, and, then, and then some credit given if they are um, a subcontract with a SWAM business. We don't get into all those details, but, but, they, um, but, but yeah, we, we, VITA encourages a SWAM business, they evaluate that, they add that into the evaluation, but it's not, certainly not an absolute requirement. And you would use the um, the uh, the SWAM for the supplier procurement and subcontracting plan to indicate that in your response. All right, we'll wait just one more minute here to see if there are any further questions. Yeah, the other thing I'll add, Tim, is for this first round for the purchase of assets, providers can presume that there is no cost to the purchase of those assets and wait for further updates from us. Okay. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. I'll just I'll start off with some closing remarks um, and then, you know, but do feel free if you want to continue typing some, that's fine. Um, so after this call, as, as we mentioned, we will post this, uh, this recording on YouTube. It does appear to be recording correctly. Um, we will also post uh, this presentation in PDF. I've corrected the, the due date, which was incorrectly stated at the beginning of the presentation as 2016. We look forward to your, your proposals, in fact, in 2017. Um, and we'll post a list of, of registrants to the conference. Um, we're also beginning the Q&A phase now. Uh, of course, we've already started to ask some questions. We work as quickly as possible to get answers back. You can ask questions about requirements. You could ask for data. You could ask process questions. Um, you know, if something doesn't make sense in one of the documents, there are many documents here, and we've probably made an error at some, some point. So if you see something you're not sure about, please feel free to ask a question. Um, we, we do publicize all questions and answers for all suppliers. And so, so that also means we want to encourage you to not include, you know, when, you know, obviously we'll get an email from you, it'll have your name, that sort of thing. Um, but when you write out the request, it, it's easier for us if you don't reference your name or your proposal or something like that within it. But you do reference, hey, in Exhibit 2.1, I see XYZ, I'm not sure what it means, can you help clarify? You know, please point us to where it is in the, in the RFP and what your question is. Uh, then we will, um, as quickly as we can, usually within a few days, um, and it may be a little, little more latency over the holidays here, but, um, but within a few days we try and post regular updates on EVA with uh, all of the questions and answers. So um, please, please uh, ask away. Um, we end the, the Q&A phase about a week before the proposals are due. That's for just pragmatic reasons of, you know, if, if you're getting answers too late, um, you, know, you can't really incorporate them into the proposal anyway. So um, I think that's about it for logistical notes. Always, as, as we've said, go through Bridget. Um, we tell um, people within VITA and within the Commonwealth the same. If they hear anything from suppliers, if you know, out of process, uh, we tell them to send it back through to Bridget. And as she mentioned, it's very much for consistency. We want you to get the right answer. And, um, and, and Bridget represents the method to get the right answer from the experts within VITA who know this uh, RFP. I don't see any further questions, so I think we will close. Um, we want to thank you again for your time today and, and, uh, and, and, the, and the quick availability for this call. We hope it's been valuable to you. Um, if you have any further questions, please, please send them along. Uh, Bridget, is there anything you would like to add in, in closing? Uh, no, Tim, I believe we have covered everything. I would just like to say again, thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and I look forward to working with all of you throughout the process. Thank you. Take care, and uh, we'll, we'll hope to hear from you soon. Bye. Right. Thanks.